Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Back in the 1960s on into the early 1970s, if you wanted a big cod, and we're talking here of fish that regularly went £30 plus, there was only one location on most UK sea anglers' minds, Scotland's Inner Clyde. Geographically, the Inner Clyde is a very big expanse with quite a wide range of well spread out specific marks, some of which we'll look at in a little more detail later. But without doubt, the most famous mark amongst them has to be the Gantox, helped into top slot to no small extent by the activities of the legendary trio, comprising Doug Dinney, Bill Freshwater and George Mann. Unfortunately, they are no longer with us, but sharing both the mark and the fish with them on a regular basis was Lancashire boat angler Tony Bridge, who joins us today to talk through this particularly impressive and important slice of Scottish and British sea angling history. Now you're a bit younger than me, and I only just caught the tail end of the Clyde Cod mania back in the 1970s, so you must have been in your early teens at the time. My age now is 52. I was quite young when I was fishing the Gantox, a young teenager. Uh, My brother who fished with me, my brother Nick, and my father, Derek, who unfortunately is not here anymore. My brother's a couple of years older than me. We virtually used to fish the Clyde through the winter. If we could get up every weekend in winter, we'd be up there, weather permitting. Obviously found out regarding the Gantox, we used to see a small dinghy called the Trio fishing there. The Trio was George Mann, Bill Freshwater and Doug Dinner, who used to have immense catches of cod there. Once we realised this, at the time we were actually fishing a mark nearby to the Gantox called Warden Bank, and we thought that was exceptional, catching fish up to high double figures on small like abu spinning tight rods with small multipliers light lines small perks having excellent sport but obviously notice that the trio were catching fish a lot bigger than we were so that's when we started to have a look and fish the gantox mark itself as you pointed out the gantox was a standout mark amongst several other big cod producers so can we now take a closer look at exactly what the Gantox mark was, and both its ability and importance in terms of attracting so many sea anglers and so many very big fish? Well, the Gantox, actually, if, if people look and see the Gantox, they'll think it's the beacon off straight off the noon, and that is not the Gantox mark. The Gantox is actually the mark called the noon bank, and you're right on the shipping lane, and... You're actually anchor, and the exact spot is 32 fathoms. We used to anchor in 32 fathoms. And I don't know what it is about the mark, but some days we could be there fishing and catching fish after fish. There could be two or three boats within 20, 30 yards of us and catching nothing, or vice versa. And what makes it this exact spot? We used to line the gantocks up with the boys, and roughly we knew... If you were just on the spot, it was so small, I don't know why, we couldn't, we never sounded, found anything on the sounder, hence the sounders aren't like they are now, we're on the old ferrograph type sounder, but we couldn't really see anything on the bottom, but the, the mark was small, but if you're on it, you knew, because if the fish were there, you were getting them. A lot of people, myself included, were under the impression that this was a wreck, so was that not the case then? Well, there was a wreck there, but you didn't fish anywhere near the wreck. There was a wreck that was in about... can't just remember the depth of the wreck, but you were actually fishing a few hundred yards away from the wreck. The fish weren't there because of the wreck. The fish were actually coming up the shipping lane, up the main channel. That's where all these, what were Atlantic running fish, to come into, they were coming into the Clyde, to the sea lock, hence Gare Lock, Holy Lock, Lock Long, Lock Goyle, they were run up there in winter to spawn. That's the only reason they were coming into the Clyde. And what was the seasonality of this main big cod run? The main season for the fishing was virtually November through till January. Maybe October. But even probably through the year you could catch fish there. But we didn't tend to fish it apart from winter time. And what were the best tides, would you say? Mm, didn't really matter. You didn't have a lot of tide run there. It was probably a decent sized tide, but um, the fish always seemed to come on on the flood. Sometimes they came on 
on the early flood sometimes they actually came on more towards higher water but even though sometimes you knew you're anchored on the right spot you might not be catching but you just knew that you would just give it an hour longer because there's always a chance of a few fish moving through which happened many times and this is where the trio both made and maintained their reputation I remember very well at the time pictures in the press of the small open board with something like little submarine emblems on the bow one for each cod over forty pounds they'd caught rather like pilots in the war I suppose painting little swastikas on the plane's nose symbolising German aircraft they'd shot down but they did and there many on the side of the boat that were over forty they were all from Edinburgh they were George Mann, Doug Dinney, Bill Freshwater unfortunately Doug Dinney died I think he had his own shop and I think he got shot so they did find a replacement but I can't just remember what he was called we didn't actually know them to talk to we only ever used to see them when we were fishing near them and they were very friendly and we always got on well with them you know because they knew we caught and we knew they caught so we both had, we had respect for each other really apart from them coming from Edinburgh I mean sometimes if the fish were about because they were only in a small dinghy and three people they used to launch over at um, Closh Point across the Clyde sometimes you have to put a boy on the anchor rope and go back to <laughs> back to where they parked to unload the fish and then start again because there was there was getting too many fish in their boat but it was only like a, a 12 14 foot small dinghy it wasn't a big dinghy at all but really that's about all I know about the trio it's hard to believe really but just a small open boat with something like a four horse seagull outboard strapped to the back of it but that's the way it was back then with some absolutely outstanding fish yeah just a small little outboard yeah yeah so what were sea conditions typically like and more to the point what could they get like in terms of safety for such a small boat getting out on a regular basis Clyde's pretty protected the worst wind for the Clyde was anything probably it's hard to recall now because we're going back probably over 30 years but it obviously if you had a, anything maybe south south west west that blew down the Clyde from the outer Clyde you could get quite a decent sea running we obviously could tail the dinghies but we were in a, a Mitchell 31 foot boat I mean we've been on there when it's been really quite rough but it's very rare that we didn't be able to get to the Gantox and fish it because the Clyde, as we say, is quite protected. I meant to ask you earlier, actually, about your own boat. So now might be a good time to fill us in on a few of the details there, having just talked about the trio and what sea conditions could be like. The boat was a Mitchell 31-foot sea angler. In them days, they were built in New Haven. We actually bought it when well, my father went down and got the boat. We actually got it delivered and had it built. We actually built it at a garage that my father's friend had in Carnforth. It was brought up there, real basically as a bare shell, the boat, with an engine in and all the running gear. And we actually built the boat up for our use in uh, probably a record amount of time. We were there working every day, apart from the work, to run the business. Any spare moment, we were there. And within three months, the boat was on the Clyde. That was 70... I'm um, not just exactly sure what year it was. It was early 70s. And how did he get it up to the Clyde? Transported up. So where actually were you based? Originally it was based at Loch Goylehead, and then actually we realised we weren't fishing round Loch Goylehead. Every, nearly all our fishing was either the Gantox or in summertime further afield off the Isle of Arran. So... We left Loch Goylehead, and because we could sleep on the boat, we actually were based in Kit Marina on the Clyde itself, which was about probably three miles from the Gantox, which was very handy. What we've been concentrating the talk on so far have been the big headline fish. But what was the fishing like on a more general day-to-day -day basis? What, through the season or winter time? Both. Well, we didn't really ever fish it through. If we fished ever there in summer, we sometimes actually fished round the wreck. And there was there was good catches of fish round the wreck. But you very rarely got many cod off the Gantox in the winter that were under double figures. It was very, very rare to get a fish under 10. The average size of fish, I would say, was probably a high teen to early 20. 
There are also exceptional coalfish on there up to probably high doubles. We've been on there and had coalfish to nearly 20 pounders. But obviously we didn't fish bait, we fished perks, which curtails getting any, maybe there might have been conger there or, or what else might have been an odd ling. I don't think there were many ling. We only had odd small ling there. It was mainly cod and odd coalfish sometimes. And it was there or thereabouts, if my recollection serves me well, that perk fishing for cod was introduced to UK sea anglers. Well, I mean, its preference is perks. We did articles for Sea Angler in the 70s with Bob Gleddle, and one of the articles I remember vividly was called Droppers of Flutterers, and that's about perks. We virtually used mainly all Abu perks, and one of my favourites was like a Cillan, which was a fish type. My father, he liked the Cillan, which was a slightly more of a flutterer. The Cillan was mine, was a heavy, quite heavy, and it dropped very quickly. Didn't flutter as much. My father's choice, he liked this, might have been called a Lucas. That fluttered slightly more. My brother's choice, he quite liked the Egan, which was like um hexagonal shape. All around 200 grams, because we were fishing 32 fathoms. It was really all about choice. Some days someone might catch more than others, but that could happen on a boat any time. But we always felt perks give you the best chance of catching the bigger fish. Because if you notice, I think basically when fish get into double figures, that's what they're feeding on is other fish. Perks, certainly from a rod and line fishing perspective, as I understand it, were developed in Scandinavia. So Abu would be in a very strong position to introduce them to the UK and grab a major portion of the early market action. Yes, they were. Yeah, they, Abu were the main perk makers, manufacturers in those days that we can remember. There were other makes you did get perks from, but Abu had a hell of a selection of perks. And they were bringing different models out all the time, you know, as they became more popular. We used to use them on the small spinning type rods for summer cod. On the Abu small, like a spinning rod with a small 5 to 6,000 C, 12 to 15 pound line, and use these like little 2 ounce various Abu perks, which we did tremendous success on. But like I say, in those days, the stocks of cod, well, everywhere, but in the Clyde itself, were unbelievable, unlike nowadays. One thing I do recall on the Clyde cod scene from back then was lots of stuff in the press about people filling chrome tubes with lead and collecting car door handles from scrapyards to make their own perks up. Did you ever get involved in, or have you had any experience of that? No, we never made our own, because we used to... We used to do quite well out of Abu because through Bob Gleddle we got to know Tony Perry, who was, I don't know if he was the MD for Abu, based in Glasgow, and we had him on our boat as a guest a couple of times, or more than that, two or three times. Looked after him, and you could say he looked after us as well. So we always used Abu perks because we really didn't have to um, make our own. But there's no problem about making your own like the Whitby lads used to do. A good idea. Why not? I must admit, I made all sorts of perks using everything from chrome tape copper tubes to pram handles. Some worked and some didn't. Yeah, you buy them now, they just... You can actually see them work in the water, you know. Yeah. If you just work them, like, just, you can actually see how they work a bit. Some do flutter more. The ones I particularly like, and I've used them recently to great success in Norway, are the three-sided salt crokens, which flutter on the drops, sending out glints of light from the three different angled sides. I like them to flutter. I think they're nice. There were well. one called Sextet. That were another I abuse. remember. I mean, to be honest, we'd have bag upstairs. We yeah. still had them. My brother's got them up his way now. He'll probably never use them. With all these, there were Lucas, Prisma, Egan... Actually, the Egan one, it was the Egan. The Prisma's the one, the hexagonal one. But there were about five or six different sorts of perks. And because they were becoming popular, they were bringing more different models out with Abu. Now, obviously, the Gantox wasn't the only hotspot capable of producing big cod. Far from it, in fact. The Rue Narrows, Helensborough and Gerlock, to name but a few, also played their part. So tell us what you remember about some of those other famous marks. I don't think I've ever fished the Gairlock, which is the Rue Narrows, Ellensbury Gairlock, because we were originally based at Loch Goylehead. We used to fish Loch Goylehead, round Loch Goyle, more towards the entrance of Loch Goyle, 
caught umpteen cod there up to high doubles, but never really into twenties. But there will be fish there into twenties. The, the run up to Arica up lot long was renowned for big cod. But that was another area because we're actually going in the wrong direction. When we got to the head of Lock Goyle, to the end, sorry, the entrance of Lock Goyle, onto Lock Long, we always went down more towards the entrance to the Clyde. To go to Arica, we're actually going in the wrong direction. And we knew the fishing, to be honest, going towards, like, say, the Gantox area. But we have fished, like, down Lock Long. We've fished Holy Lock and had success, but... Not with the amount of cod consistently the size that we ever got at the Gantox. The Rue Narrows at the entrance to Gerlock was also supposed to be a very good concentrating ambush point. I never actually got to fish it, but my boat partner Dave Devine had some great catches there on a number of occasions back in the early 70s, even on into the summer months. Yeah, it was unbelievable, and, and some of the shore reports there, the lads used to come up and and fish the uh, the opens, you know, the open show matches, the Fleetwood boys and some of the Geordies used to go up and uh, unbelievable bags of cod. Not always massive in size, but umpteen fish. Catches in four hours up to 40, 50 pound of fish, which is, you're working hard to get that off the shore. I remember fishing Helensboro once with Eric McVicker, and what a waste of time that trip proved to be. Lots of talk, but unfortunately no action. I also fished out a Gurok, and with not much more to show for it, though in fairness it was probably already well past its best. I did, however, also do quite a few trips to Arakar at the top of Lot Long, where we managed to find cod to double figures. You wouldn't do that now. In fact, you probably wouldn't catch anything at all there these days. We used to hire a self-drive dinghy there, and as you headed down the lock, for as far as you could see, there would be red and yellow spots all over the rocks which were the shore anglers fishing in the bright waterproofs. And similarly out on the lock, there would be boats absolutely everywhere. Did you ever fish Lock Long? Well, when we originally went to Scotland, it was my father who had the boat built near Carnforth, up in like North Lancashire. He actually had a boat and he actually had a chalet at Lock Goylehead. My father went up once before we'd ever been up with him, to have a look at somewhere to moor his boat, and he'd heard about these chalets. Uh, they went up and looked at this and thought, what a fantastic place. The scenery was unbelievable. Just the area was nice and quiet, perfect shelter for anchoring a boat, for a mooring. So it was my father's friend who originally brought his boat up. Not, he wasn't a fisherman, but that's how my father first saw it. And then we used to go up and stay in his chalet sometimes in winter time. Before we had a boat to, to fish out on the sea, but we used to shore fish, and we used to fish on the, the shore round, just up from Arica. In a way, we were a bit numb in those days at shore fishing. We've had fish on, what size we never saw, but they were unbelievable fish. They were really giving you a good fight, but unfortunately got stuck or lost them on their way in, because basically we, we didn't really know what we were doing in those days, but... We knew that the fishing then was, that was probably early 70s then. The fishing then was like, it was tremendous. Anywhere on the Clyde, you had a chance of like a 20, 30 pounder, even on the shore. They got some pretty big conger down at the Arakar end as well. Yes, there will be, yeah, yeah. Very deep lock, lock long. Not wide across, but just go straight down, because the first time we went and we cast out, my father couldn't believe he thought there was something wrong with the reel because the reel kept empty in line. And it was, it took about, it used to feel like five minutes before the actual, the lead hit the bottom. But even casting, say, say 80, 100 yards or whatever from the shore, you were probably fishing like virtually nearly 30 fathoms because it just went straight down. So most of your fishing, and certainly most of your memorable fish, came from the Gantox mark. Can you recall for us here some of the better catches and bigger fish, just to give people a flavour of what the fishing could be like back then? Oh, I can't remember them really. Good job I've got this album that my father did before he died, and just to keep reminding me, but uh, we had many catches there. I remember once there were just my brother, myself, my dad, and we had nearly getting on for a £1,000 in two hours, two and a half hours, and virtually every fish was a 20 plus. We were putting fish over 20 back, I think that day we'd we'd four or five over 30, maybe two at 35 or six and 32s, 
31s, 30s and I also remember I was fishing and uh, I, I just dropped my rod on the gunwale and I uh, was gaffing a fish for my brother and my father and uh, brought his fish aboard and, and I turned around and my rod was bent double about to go in and had a double. It was either high 20 or an early 30 fish just as my light perk was just sta- stationary. It was unbelievable the fishing at times. Sometimes it was frustrating because you could be there and uh, you could just fish it for two, three hours and, and perking's quite hard work in like 200 foot of water but you knew you'd to stick at it because you knew you just get a few of these Atlantic fish running through which they could do at any time but you could be fishing for two hours for nothing and then half an hour you could be bagging up one after another you know and, and nearly all the fish were like they were either high teens or uh, or 20s plus 30s for odd 40s So you had fish in the 40s then did you? I never got a 40. My brother had a 40. He had a 41. That was actually the biggest fish of the year because he won quite a few awards for that off different newspapers. The same day, I wasn't on that trip. It was a friend of my father's and his son. And his son had never caught a cod before. And he was fishing. We had it, probably lent him a rod and put him on a perk. And his first cod was a 32 pounder. <laughs> I wonder why it was then that the trio managed to get as many £40 plus cod as they did. What were they doing so right that others perhaps weren't? We don't really know, to be honest, because we never really saw them till I have, sit down and have a chat to. We only ever saw them while they were fishing. I can't remember how long they were actually fishing this mark before we started. They could have been fishing it quite a few years. Obviously, all this visitor activity would also have been a major boost for the local economy. Then, suddenly, it was all over. All that potential catching and spending power lost almost at a stroke. Commercial fishermen with the live for today mentality destroyed not only a fantastic fishery, but also the livelihoods of many people who'd invested money into and were dependent on it. So what do you know about the true reasons for the decline, and how quickly it happened? Well, commercially, they obviously knew that these fish that come from the Atlantic, these big cod to spawn... They obviously knew they were coming into our sea locks. They were coming up and sometimes they were netting at night, trawling the locks at night, but I think what they did, and it's not really rocket science, if you look at the entrance to the Clyde between the Cumbria and and the Isle of Butte, it's not a wide area. And I think what they did, they actually caught the fish before they got into the Clyde itself. They looked at the shipping lanes and the channels and probably just... uh, that's where they were get targeting, I think, really the fishing. I think they were actually nailing the fish before they actually got round to the Gantox area, which was a shame because, uh, say, we could go there now and I could fish for, for a month and, you know, might not get even a cod. Might, you, you might struggle to get a cod over £10 now. I don't know, but I don't think there's much there now. With hindsight, it wasn't so much a decline as a total annihilation. It's hard to imagine these days that what we know didn't actually happen could have been allowed to happen. And now it's pretty much a marine desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually stopped going up there probably late 70s, so... But even then, it it was still okay then, but not as good as it was. And obviously it deteriorated sadly in the next few years. So really, um, yeah, it is how it can go from what it was... I mean, you'd think there'd still be a a run of fish, but no, I don't think there is anymore. No, I don't think they're there. So looking back at how it used to be, do you think that maybe with legislation and encouragement, the client could ever return to even a reasonable percentage of those glory days? Not a chance, no, no. I think you only have to look at uh, the trawler programmes now, and trawlermen, to look how far that even the trawlers are having to go now to catch a decent sort of fishing and virtually nearly all the fishing is like out from the Shetland Isles or towards nearer towards Norway. I think the, the North Sea's virtually been wiped out for virtually any sort of sizeable cod or haddock within like a 40 mile range of like your, your large fishing ports like Peterhead or Fraserborough and these fish that used to come in, these Atlantic fish, unfortunately I just don't think they're there anymore. There'll be areas that still have fish, but it's probably not worth the commercial boys doing it anymore because the fishing ain't there anymore. It's a shame. Getting back to the trio, who from an historical perspective put the Gantocks on the Sea Angling map, how special were they, if at all? 
Or was it more a case of some incredible sea fishing being available, and they, like you, were in the right place at the right time? Right place at the right time. It's, you, you can say that about anybody, but you've also got to be able to fish. If you're in the right place, you're fishing the right method, and you can fish, you'll catch. Even someone who doesn't actually fish would catch on the Gantuck when the fishing was there. They wouldn't catch what a good angler would, but they'd still catch. But the trio were good because they actually probably found this mark, which, if you look at the map, and you look, everybody called it the Gantux, but if you, we actually did an article on this. My father did another article with Bob Gledel in Sea Angler regarding this Gantux, and we used, I think it was called Gantux Kidology, because the Gantux isn't actually where the mark is. Actually, the mark is off the noon bank. But uh, to find the mark, it's hard to tell people how hard it was. Sometimes we could be on it and I'd say to me, Dad, I don't think we're just on the mark here. And we used to have arguments galore. And, and it's not easy having to re-anchor from like 30-odd fathoms. But sometimes we'd re-anchor three or four times if, if the wind was coming from a different place. Just to get in the spot, which was virtually probably the size of a house. But, you know, if I just felt, if we didn't think we were just on it, if we weren't just on 32 fathoms, if we're in 30 fathoms... Uh, 29, I thought, we're not on it. And, and you knew you were fishing, and, and we, we used to re-anchor. Sometimes we'd re-anchor three or four times, but when you got it right and the fish were there, you knew, because, as I say, we could be catching, boats around us could be catching nothing, absolutely nothing, and we're catching one after the other. Hence, it could be vice versa. Equally, I suppose, you could also anchor the right spot at what seemed to be the right time and with the right gear and still end up catching nothing. You could, yes, yeah, you could. But no, <laughs> but yes, yeah. But because you, you you knew what you've caught there in the past, so you're always even though sometimes the fishing. The only reason was if the fish weren't running through, but you always felt confident that something could happen. And when you're fishing for fish of that size, you don't mind putting a bit more effort in, do you? In some ways, this story reflects the fantastic jumbo cod fishing along Lancashire's file coast at around about the same time. Certainly with respect to what by today's standards might look like primitive boats, outboards and tackle, though with your much bigger boat and access to what at the time were state-of-the-art perks from Tony Perrin at Abu, you perhaps at least had one foot in the modern era. Yet yourself and the trio were catching cod, the likes of which people now have to travel to Norway to find. I should perhaps make the point here that Norway is not a member of the European Union, and for the most part is commercially fished with hooks albeit from electrically powered jigging machines. It's sad to think that something once so prolific could actually be reduced to a virtual desert and almost overnight. But it was, and over 30 years later, still remains so. My thanks then to Tony Bridge for recalling the highlights of his own fishing, along with that of Doug Dinney, Bill Freshwater and George Mann, who will forever remain a part of Scottish sea angling history. Music